Okay, it is four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to Crow Canyon's webinar for this week. Um, we have a program tonight called Why Do We Call Them Kivas? And we have three guests today. It's going to be a little bit of a, a panel discussion. Um, our presenters will, will talk first and then, and then we'll sort of open it up to questions at that point. Our, our three scholars tonight, Susan Ryan, Steve Lexon, and Lyle Belanqua. Before we start with that, just a few logistics. First of all, some big thank yous. Um, big thanks to Dylan Schwint and Taylor Hasbrook, who are the geniuses who make this all possible uh, behind the scenes uh, technologically. And I also want to um, thank some funders that we have. We've gotten funding by, from, sorry, funding has been provided by Colorado Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act economic stabilization plan of 2020. So they are definitely uh, making this possible. I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Michelle Turner. I'm an archeologist here at Kirk Canyon. Um, all right, for those of you who are new to Zoom or have any problems, uh, just a few logistics. First of all, you'll see that we have, you know, we're, our heads are sort of floating probably somewhere on your screen. If they're in your way, you can always move them. I just click on them and drag them out of the way. Uh, you can also ask questions, but please use the Q&A tab down at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get to all of our questions. Uh, our panelists are planning to leave plenty of time for questions tonight, so go ahead and ask questions uh, as we go along or at the end, and I will be um, sort of passing your questions on to the panelists later. If you're having any trouble with your Zoom link, uh, you can always try our Facebook Live, which is going on at the same time. Uh, it's under Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And this uh, entire program will be on our YouTube station uh, in, a, in a day or two. And um, all of our previous webinars are also up there. So uh, you can subscribe and see all of them at crowcanyon.org uh, backslash YouTube. Crow Canyon Archaeological Center has the mission of um, empowering present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And if you'd like to know more about Crow Canyon, uh, there's our website, it's crowcanyon.org. Uh, just wanted to let you know about next week's webinar. Uh, we have this uh, webinar called Exploring the Interplay Between Climate and People in the Ancient U.S. Southwest with Colleen Strawhacker and Grant Snicker, Snitker. That is next Thursday, so same place, same time. As you know, this is a hard time for a lot of people and a lot of Native American groups here in the Southwest. We've had a lot of requests about how people can help, how people can donate and make a difference. Uh, so we have this list that we are, are uh, sharing. Um, several groups that are listed there, and I believe that those of you who signed up on Zoom will also see this uh, in an email after the webinar. But real briefly, the groups that are listed here are the Pueblo Relief Fund, the official Navajo Nation COVID Relief Fund, the Hopi Relief Fund, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, and the Bluff Area Mutual Aid Fund. All right, so our presentation tonight on Kivas. Um, let me introduce our three speakers before I turn it over to them. So our first speaker, uh, I believe the order will be Steve Lexon will go first. Um, Steve Lexon uh, now is retired, but he was a curator at the Natural History Museum at the University of Colorado. He specializes both in Chacoan and Mimbra's archeology. span And around here, he's especially well known for his book, The Chaco Meridian, which is course, been very uh, influential in this region, the Four Corners. And his most recent book is called A Study of Southwestern Archaeology. Susan Ryan is our chief mission officer here at Kirk Canyon. She's worked on archaeological projects in the Midwest and here in the Southwest for many years. And her interests include architecture, Chaco and influence in the northern San Juan, and identity formation. And her PhD dissertation happened to be an in-depth study of ancestral Pueblo and Kivas and communities of practice. So she's bringing a lot to our session today. And then Lyle Belanqua is a member of the Greasewood clan from Bakabi village at Hopi. 
He has worked in the American Southwest as an, archeolo- as an archeologist documenting ancestral Hopi settlements and life ways. He will be combining his professional knowledge and training with personal insights about his ancestral history to provide a unique perspective on kivas and their significance to Hopi culture. So I will go ahead and turn this over to Steve. Okay, now I have to hijack the screen here. Okay, I've stopped my share. All right. Hmm. Okay, I think we're all right. Um, and just just checking because we've had some I've had some technical issues today, but I'm coming through okay. Okay. So why do we call them kivas? Let's start off by who's this we? Um, Talking about archeologists and park rangers and people that write coffee table books and pass that all on. We'll talk about the perspective from Hopi. Uh, So I'm talking about the archeological perspective of why all these little round rooms at a place like Cliff Palace, which is Pueblo three, and I'm gonna assume some familiarity with the Pecos system, the Basket Maker 3, P1, P2, P3, P4 in the audience here. Um, why are these little round rooms? Why do we call them kibas? I was curious about that for reasons that will be clear shortly here. Well, we call them kibas because that's what Major Powell told us to call them. Uh, Major John Wesley Powell was an interesting fella. He got his arm shot off at the Battle of Shiloh, but still managed to go through the whole Vicksburg campaign and the Battle of Nashville, and he went to Sherman's March to the Sea. He's a tough guy, and I guess if he told you what to, to do, he did it. He ran the Bureau of American Ethnology in its early, early days, late 19th, early 20th century, very early 20th century. And uh, he laid down the law. His training was in geology. I should point out that all these guys I'm talking about didn't have any training in history or archaeology or whatever. They're, they're trained in different disciplines. Victor Mendeleev, who's a name some of you may know from his Remarkable book, Study of Pueblo Architecture in 1891. He later wrote that at the suggestion of Major Powell, the Tusian, which is the Hopi word, for this ever-present feature of Pueblo architecture has been... uh, I actually actually can't see this myself because my head's in the way. Just a second here. Has been adopted as being much more appropriate than a stufa, which is what the Spanish called them. The word kiva then will be understood to designate the ceremonial chamber of Pueblo building peoples, ancient and modern. Because these guys all assumed that exactly what was going on in the present is exactly the same as what was going on in the past. So ancient and modern. So Powell laid down the law and everybody in the BAE, Bureau of American Ethnology, uh, accepted that. And since they were basically archaeology at that point, um, that pretty much took care of that. Hmm. A little trouble advancing my slides. There we go. And Jesse Walter Fuchs brought it to Mesa Verde. Uh, Fuchs is trained as a marine biologist, I believe. Uh, but he he in, inflicted himself on Hopi, uh, got into some kivas he probably shouldn't have, um, pissed people off, I'm sure. Uh, he is also with the Bureau of American Ethnology, and he he knew Major Powell and knew what Major Powell told him to say. But he you know he had no problem. He he went up to Mesa Verde, that's Cliff Palace. Uh, he was the first government archaeologist to go up there, supposed to sort things out and you know tell people what they were seeing. He looked at all these little round rooms and said, oh, it's Kiva, it's Kiva, it's Kiva, it's Kiva. It didn't seem to bother him. There's like 20 or 30 of these things at Cliff Palace. So even using that term Kiva, we, again, being the archaeologists, for 125 years, which is, what is that, four or five generations? I mean, so it's it's in the water now. It's baked in that, that these little things are Kivas. Um, about 40 years ago, I had my doubts about that because we we learned stuff. I hope we've learned stuff since Jesse Walter Fuchs and Major Powell were kicking around. And one of the things we learned is that, you know, you can go from the present to the past. That helps. But you also need to be going from the deep past to the not so deep past. And it turns out people were living in pit houses uh, for centuries and centuries. Uh, I got, I'm showing you a Basket Maker 3 pit house here. But they were living in pit houses in Basket Maker 2 in the late archaic. That's the house. That's that's what, and it's a fine house. You excavate something, you have a, a fairly substantial uh, roof over it, and in back behind it, in Basket Maker 3, they've got labeled storage rooms here. Those are really very elaborate, uh, uh, solid, solid storage pits. And usually there's three or four or five of these behind each pit house. So that's what a house was. That's what a family lived in. 
in Basket Maker 3. Let's move it up a notch to Pueblo 1, which is the next thing, 700 to 900. This Duckfoot site that Ricky Lightfoot uh, excavated with Crow Canyon. And he didn't call them this, but now you know, archaeologists start talking about proto kivas in Pueblo 1 because Major Powell said those things in Pueblo 2 and Pueblo 3 are kivas. So you got to get on the good foot here, get on the march and you know, turn these things into kivas. But Ricky was able at Duckfoot to separate that site into three households. And out in front of each one is a pit structure, one per family. And back behind are four or five rooms that are taking the place of those four or five uh, storage pits that were behind the basket maker tree sites. Now, all the rooms in the, rear, in the rear row are storage rooms, and probably most of the ones in the front are too. So five rooms in a pit structure, five rooms in a pit structure. That became the family house in Pueblo II. This is the time period of Chaco Canyon. This is a, a regular site, a, a regular house, a normal person's house in Chaco. Actually, two families. 3C site that was dug by Gordon Vivian, Gwen's, Gwen's father. Um, and you know, the pattern is really clear. Uh, you know, five, four rooms, five rooms, and storage rooms mainly. And a pitch structure out front. But because of Major Powell, these are now kivas. You're kiva 1 and kiva 2. Because by God, by P2, they're kivas. But they're exactly the same, you know, in terms of, of uh, the, the idea, the concept. is still a pitch structure with five rooms or four rooms in the back. Take that up to Pueblo 3, which is the time period of Mesa Verde. And it's, it's so standardized, the archaeologists have jargon for it called a unit Pueblo, because it's like a rubber stamp. There's thousands of these things all over the four corners. And they're a regular family house. This is what family lived in. It was a pit structure out front, but by now, now it's a kiva, because Major Powell said so. And four rooms in the back, which are mainly storage. I mean, they're doing some other things in there, too, but they're, it's mainly like the pantry keeps getting more and more formal. You go from the pits to the, you know, a little better masonry, a little better masonry, P3, you know, pretty good masonry. Same with the pit structure. It goes from being uh, earth wall to, you know, by Pueblo 3, they have masonry walls, all that kind of stuff, but it's still a pit structure. And it's still, I mean, we call them kivas, but it's really part of a family house. It's a single family house. Every family has one of these things. Um, and we'll get in, maybe Lauer can talk about this, but I, that is not how it works in modern Pueblos. Every family doesn't have a kiva. At 1300, they quit doing that. Um, I forgot to time myself here. Oh, sorry. 1300, they quit doing that. Uh, they, every family doesn't have a little pit structure out front. Uh, at a site like Arroyo Hondo, uh, which is a thousand rooms, something like that, there, there are no single family pit structures. Uh, this looks like a modern Rio Grande Pueblo where you have a thousand rooms and you're living in apartments now. They're, they're out of the ground entirely. They're living in apartments. And there's four or five subterranean structures that are what are modern kivas whatever that is, uh, uh, you know, it's one per village or one or two per village at, at other sites and at modern Rio Grande Pueblos, uh, not one per family. Okay, I need to get this moving here. Um, so how did Major Powell and Jesse Walter Fuchs and the archaeologists for five generations believing that these little things are key? How did that screw us up? Because it did. Like Yellow Jacket, that's a site that Crow Canyon worked on, Kristen Kunkelman, many of you know her. And Joe Van Wheat, whose job I had until recently, uh, worked there too, has 195 kisses over near northwest of Crow Canyon. Big Mesa Verde site, P3 site, has 195 kivas. Boy, that's a lot of kivas. I remember Joe Ben at a conference saying, why do you need all those kivas, 195 kivas? Because they're not kivas. I mean, the guy's gone now, but uh, they're not kivas. They're the pit structures, and they, you know, it has 900 rooms, and it winds up being five rooms per kiva, per pit structure. And uh, Yellow Jack is just a whole line after line after line of those little unit problems where every family has a pit structure out front. But because Major Powell said they were kivas, we get stuff like this in the 80s where this is one of Joe, you know, Joe Ben and Fred Lang and, you know, good people, smart people. You know, Mark Chenault, I don't cater. Um, they made Yellow Jack at a Four Corners Anasazi Ceremonial Center because it had 200 kivas. It had like more churches than... You know, like a West Texas Baptist town per person. I mean, it's just, you know, 200 kivas, my God, is a ceremonial center. No, it's not. It's a village where each one of those kivas is actually part of a family house. Doesn't mean there wasn't ceremony and ritual in them, sure, but it's like family level, probably. Uh, births, marriages, deaths, whatever, kinds of stuff that pertains to a family. But really, it's, it's the heart of the home. It's the old pitch structure. So I need to get this going here. Oh, there we go. So I really got on this because I was interested in population in Chaco Canyon, and this is almost over. 
where you have these great houses. This is not what normal people live in. Um, and they have hundreds of rooms, all right? And what people were doing in the 80s, this is all 40 years ago when I was doing this stuff, is you count the number of rooms and then you have some multiplier that you figured out from ethnographic accounts or something. That, you know, basically, it comes down to like one room equals one person. Not each person had a room, but the, if you had 500 rooms, you had probably 500 people. But that wasn't working with great houses uh, for various reasons. There are reasons I'll show you in a second. So I said, well, okay, if they're before and during and after Chaco, everybody's house is five rooms in a pit structure, which we call kivas. If that's what they do before, during, and after Chaco, maybe those smaller round rooms at, at uh, Chaco are actually habitations. They're, they're actually where people are living, not the big ones out in the plaza, what they call great kivas. I'll we'll talk about that very briefly in a second. But you go into, here's an example, Ouijiji, Ouijiji. Uh, which is kind of a weird one, but it's, you know, maybe 200 rooms, which, you know, by the old rule of thumb and, you know, 40 years ago would be, oh, maybe 200 people, 250 people, something like that. But only two of these round rooms, two kivas, which I think are, represent a household. And they're, they're large, so, you know, an extended family, something like that, maybe 10 people, whatever. So maybe 20 people as opposed to 200 people. So it makes a huge difference in the population estimates you get. All the other rooms at Wajiji and most of the other great houses are storage rooms. And we figured this out in the 80s. They've all got storage room doors. You know, that there's a specific kind of door that goes in the storage room. And all these guys have storage room doors. They don't have the kind of doors that people walk through. So anyway, yeah, it's two families and a whole lot of storage, more than two families need. Okay, if, you're, if you need an architectural antecedent, for where modern, you know, the modern Kiva, and this is a, a white guy talking about stuff a white guy shouldn't be talking about. But if, if you want to chase that back in time, it'd probably make more sense to look at great Kivas, which are one per, per village, one or two per community. Much more like what you see in the Rio Grande, which again is a little different than Hopi. And I hope Fly will tell us this about that. Where you, in a modern Rio Grande village, and that's a, a Fred Cavote painting of a Rio Grande sort of idealized Rio Grande, looks a little bit like San, San Alfonso. So it's got two kivas. Yeah, you'll have one or two kivas for the whole whole village, just like you have one or two great kivas for each each settlement. So that's the argument. Why do we call them kivas? Because when we didn't know that much back in the day, these guys are smart. Paul was smart. I certainly wouldn't say something. Mean, you know, <laughs> he's a man to be reckoned with. But we've learned a lot since then, and probably one of the things that we've learned is those little round rooms at Mesa Verde and at Chaco and places like that are not kivas; they're family houses, and that's. The end of my bit of this. So I'll turn it back over to Michelle. I'll get out of here. Okay, Michelle, you back on? I think I'm going to take over next. You do that, Susan. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, how does that look? Thumbs up? Okay. All right. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk specifically about those household kivas that Steve just mentioned, and in particular in the Pueblo II and Pueblo III periods. And part of the study is examining what we're calling production groups that are creating the architecture in order to look at how they're being produced across the landscape and also through time. And the intentions around the study are, can we even identify specific production groups just by looking at Kiva architecture? And then how do we take small Kivas that are produced in small houses and compare them or contrast them to those small Kivas that are produced in great houses? And then also, what is the production of small and great Kivas? Are there similarities? Are there differences? How does that change through time? And then the same thing goes for across the entire Southwest, uh, the Northern Southwest. How do we look at Kiva production and what are similarities or differences? And the whole point in doing this exercise is to identify specific groups that have shared common architectural practices so that as archeologists and anthropologists, we can get at concepts such as identity or migrations of people across the landscape. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So when I say northern southwest, this is the study area that I've defined, and we've got the southern San Juan region, the middle, and also the northern. The southern is most famous, of course, for having Chaco Canyon in it, and the middle would be most notable for Aztec and Salmon. 
And then up here in the northern San Juan region, this is where we are in Cortez, Colorado, and also into southeast Utah. And for example, the Haney site that Crow Canyon is currently working on is located in the northern. And Steve just mentioned things about time periods and how we're defining architecture, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, here's a list of how I'm using those definitions. And I am using Powell's definition of Kiva uh, as a household, basically a part of an architectural household. Uh, but for small Kivas, I'm defining them as less than 10 meters in diameter, used for both ritual and residential activities. And the great kiva, I'm defining as 10 meters or greater, used for public integrative activities. So one is at the household level and it's private and it's small. The other is large, it's public integrative function, um, is used by all members of the public. And then of course, public architecture, I'm using as structures or features that are used by more than one household or social group. So with that in mind, I also have to tell you how I'm using small houses and great houses. And for small houses, it's basically the architectural unit that Steve showed you that had surface rooms, a kiva to the south of those surface rooms, and then a midden or refuse deposits just to the south of that kiva. And then for great houses, it's almost like putting a lot of those small houses together into one contiguous room block, and they all share a common roof. In addition to having multiple families share those great houses, they also may have other features such as multiple stories, roads, or even earthworks, and they're most commonly associated with the Chaco era. Here's an example of a small house kiva located in the northern San Juan region. Again, this would be a private structure used by a household or an extended family. Here's an example of a great kiva at Pueblo Benito in Chaco. This is greater than 10 meters in diameter and used for integrative purposes within the village. Here we've got an example of the small house with the surface rooms to the north, the kiva to the south, and then the midden would be just to the south of that kiva. And here's an example of a great house that has public architecture. So this is again an example of all those households under one roof with lots of kivas, lots of surface rooms, and even in the upper left-hand corner, there's a great kiva. Now, for this study, I borrowed a little bit of theory from actual architects. And there is a fellow by the name of Amos Rappaport who was really famous in the 1960s and 1970s because he was curious about how architectural systems can evoke meaning and how do we study the meaning that architecture conveys. Uh, and so his book that he wrote in 1969 called House, Form, and Culture informed two of the different definitions that I used throughout the study, fixed vernacular and additive vernacular. But vernacular architecture just means that you're using locally available materials and following your cultural constructs to produce a building that reflects the local environment. So for fixed vernacular, what that means is that there are certain elements constructed within a building that have to be there and they're hardly ever changeable. Additive, on the other hand, are elements that can actually be flexible and modified even though they're still present within that building. So for example, bringing it back to archeology span and kivas, I define a hearth, which is present in almost all kivas in the Northern Southwest as the fixed vernacular element. But production groups during the Pueblo II and Pueblo III used additive vernacular to make them round or square or oval or D-shaped. And so we can look at different production groups based on these additive uh, vernacular features that are flexible. Now, the other theory I borrowed comes from educational theory, and this is called communities of practice. And a community of practice is just a group of individuals who learn how to do something and they all share how they do it together. And what's interesting about this theory is that it notes that you cannot learn by yourself as an individual. You actually have to learn within a group setting. So a favorite example of mine would be if I put three people in a room and ask them to tie a bow on their shoelaces. I might actually have three different ways of tying that shoelace. They probably learned how to tie a shoelace from their family members or somebody close to them in the community. And as they have uh, kids of their own and grandkids, those generations are more likely to practice bow tying just like the people that taught them. 
And so what we have here is a community of practice where people doing things in a shared way. Now, this is important for archaeology because we can look at all things created by humans, all artifacts, all architecture, and identify those specific elements that people learn how to make. And so we're going to apply it to kivas in this case. Here's an example of a modern day community of practice at Hopi. This is on Second Mesa at the village of Shapalabi. And this group of individuals has older folks and younger folks. They're all participating in producing architecture in a similar way that will leave signatures that are going to be unlike other communities of practice, even across Hopi. So when we think about the archeological data, in order to look at these elements, I had to rely on a data set of completely excavated kivas, not partially excavated. So most of them came from section 106 compliance projects uh, and a lot coming from the cultural resource management field. But all in all, I looked at 407 kivas dating to the Pueblo II and Pueblo III, and it came from basically 97 sites total, 30 from the south, 13 from the middle, and 54 from the northern San Juan region. And to give you a glimpse into how I'm using data, this is just one example out of hundreds, but the left-hand side or column is showing you the fixed vernacular elements, the things that all kivas have um, that have to be there for it to be a kiva. The right-hand side is showing you the additive or flexible features within that architecture. So, for example, if we scroll down to the bottom and look at roof type, you have to have a roof on most kivas, although towards the end of the P3, we do go a little bit roofless, but we won't get, go down that rabbit trail. Uh, but that being said, there's flexibility in how they're produced. So you can have cribbed roofs, you can have flat roofs, you can have posts holding up the roof, so on and so forth. So these additive vernacular elements are showing us the choices and how people are learning through time. All right, so the results. If we look at house type results first, this is looking at small kivas produced in both small and great houses. And in this case, we're gonna start with the fixed. The fixed vernacular elements that are found in small houses are also found in great house kivas. There's really no difference between them. And what that shows us is that there's a high degree of conventionalism across the whole entire study area and also between the Pueblo II and Pueblo III periods. And this isn't too surprising in that this is all ancestral Pueblo people producing kivas that share a very common cultural construct around this ideology of what a kiva is and how it should look. However, when we look at the additive or the flexible features inside of them and how production groups are mediating how to use those, that's where we start to see the differences, where we have the use of small house kivas displaying a lot more variation in how they're produced than those in the great houses. And what that's telling us is that there's more diversity in the small house groups than there are in the great house groups. That also provides insight into this concept of specialization. So you may have heard archeologists talk about craft specialization at one point or another. It just means that when the population gets big enough, it means that people can actually branch off and specialize in something versus doing all the work on everything all the time yourself. And so this begs the question, with population density, do we start to see specialization in the archeological record of people whose full-time job it is to go out, build a kiva, and we get more homogeneity in the architecture as a result? If you're dealing with a small house site and a small kiva, what we have are probably those household members building their own kiva. And so there's going to be greater variation in how that is produced. Now, the other thing that we can note is that the northern San Juan region kivas have a lot more variation than the middle or the southern San Juan region kivas. So again, we've got more production groups that we can identify in the north, less so in the middle and south. The north seems to have greater flexibility. And once again, I think it's because they're not involved in those um, homogenous constructs around village life that has increasing populations and the need to 
make sure that there's a lot more um, integration amongst those groups that are moving into those villages. Okay, so next we're gonna look at Kiva size. So this is comparing and contrasting small Kivas compared to the great ones. So again, great ones are 10 meters or more, they're public, used for integrative purposes, small ones, about 3.5 meters on average. They are not seen by anybody outside of the household and they're domestic, mostly. So here's the results. Both small and great Kivas have the same fixed vernacular elements. And this is super cool to think about because what that means is Pueblo people are seeing great and small kivas as pretty much the same form, that they all have to share common architectural traits in order for those to be kivas. And what we also see, which isn't too surprising, is that small kivas have more flexibility in how they're produced and that great kivas are highly standardized compared to the small ones. And again, this makes a lot of sense anthropologically because the job of a great kiva is to integrate people from diverse backgrounds. So you don't want to display a lot of variation in the architecture. So to kind of sum some of this up, the more aggregation or population density you see in a village, the less variation in kiva construction there is. So there's different scales at which we can see this modification happening starting with the household, the private sector in the lower left-hand corner, moving all the way up to a great kiva, which is public, and then moving to the great kiva of all great kivas, which is Casa Rinconada in Chaco Canyon, which is across Chaco Wash from Pueblo Benito, the largest great kiva in the Southwest at 23 meters in diameter. That one, I believe, was used to integrate lots of people, not just from Pueblo Benito, but from many villages within the canyon. So why should we care? What is the take home message? And this is where we can go back to what are we learning by studying these communities of practice and architecture? We're learning about how to identify production groups. And that's really important to archeologists because we can get at concepts of group identity. And then from there, we can start to look at how groups are mediating architecture over time, where they might move to, uh, and also our predict particular production groups increasing or decreasing over time. It also allows us to reclassify material culture typologies. So for example, in the study, we may have a fixed vernacular type called roof support, but there might be 30 different styles of ways of producing those roof supports that don't have scientific names. So it allows us to go back and look at how we're t discussing these elements, and is there a better way to bring that information into the foreground? The other thing is about high and low visibility features and discussions. So for example, if I was to walk up to a roof support, I might see that it's tall, it's columnar, and it's holding up the roof. That would be a high visibility feature, something I can just see by walking up to it. However, that particular roof support may have a particular way it was constructed with masonry casings on the inside, or there might be a piece of wood inserted uh, almost like rebar inside of that roof support. And so that would be the low visibility features that normally we can't see, and only the people that, that constructed those buildings can actually see those elements. Um, so by looking at production and how things are put together, that gives us more access to understanding culture group identity, things like emulation. If, if someone's trying to copy something as they see it in another village and go back to their village and create architecture based on how it looked, is it, does it have the blueprints that people who have specific knowledge about how to make something, um, are, they, are they there or not? We can also look at concepts of reoccupation or are there other culture groups moving into a village? And then of course we can look at culture changes through time. One of the most important ones though is migration in that if I make a projectile point here in Cortez, that projectile point can be traded or moved across the landscape even though I stay put. And what that means for um, the way we study migration is that we have to rely on inferences about social networks. The cool thing about studying architecture is that it doesn't move. And when people create it, it stays put, even though people may move away from the architecture. So it gives us an amazing glimpse in time of how to study where people were, 
how long they were there, and then they were, where they pushed out to on the, the landscape. And then, of course, we've got effects of increasing populations. So coalescence is a big study within archaeology. We're constantly looking for ways to understand what happens to humans as they come together in environments and the population grows. And this is analogous to our big cities today. Now, in some cases, you see a lot of diversity because sometimes as populations grow, people want to become diverse and be individualized. However, in the case of the ancient Southwest, what I'm noticing with Kiva architecture is that as populations grow, there's actually a reduced diversity of how things are produced. And there's good evidence for craft specialization that accounts for that homogenous understanding of how to produce something. And it also brings together people from diverse backgrounds. It is a way to integrate the entire village. Okay, so I'm going to stop my slideshow and go ahead and mute myself and then Lyle, you're up next. <clears throat> All righty. Good afternoon, everybody out there. Uh, thanks for including me in this discussion. Um, so this title here, Kiwas in Pueblo Culture, Multiple Worlds, Multiple Perspectives, is more or less kind of a disclaimer for myself as well as to you all. Um, you know, I can only speak from, from my individual perspective. Um, there are multiple Kiva groups out here at Hopi, probably close to two dozen active Kivas with hundreds of members and their families. And then you include uh, all of the additional Pueblos in New Mexico, that number increases, you know, exponentially. So I'm not going to claim that I know all of those different perspectives. Some of them are very foreign to me. Um, so I'm really going to be speaking from just my own experience and trying to give you some sense of how he was in today's Hopi culture. Uh, we use that in terms of how we self-identify, uh, not only as a Hopi person in 2020, but when we look back into our ancestry, what are some of the uh, key components of Kivas that we can look back and say, well, you know, we come from these people. And so... Um, you know, that's kind of where I'm coming from with all of this. This Kiva here in the picture uh, is in southeastern Utah. It's a really unique place. Um, it's one of the few uh, intact Kiva structures, you know, that we've been able to work on, uh, both as archaeologists, but also taking uh, cultural advisors out to this area and getting their perspectives as well. So it's a place called Seven Kivas. There's really only like three or four, um, but, you know, that's the way it goes in archaeology. So you can go to the next slide. it up. All right, there we go. So this is a uh, Cuba replica at the Museum of Northern Arizona. And really, you know, I, I included this picture because for many of you, uh, this may be your only view of what an inside of an interior Cuba looks like. Um, you know, it is on rare occasions that outsiders are invited into a Cuba structure, you know, it happens from time to time. And um, I, I included this just to give you a sense of kind of how the structures are built here at Hopi. You'll notice that it's a four-sided structure, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, you know, in, in, in another slide here. But this is just to give you the sense of the organic nature of what a Cuba structure looks like on the interior. You know, when you're down inside this structure, uh, it really gives you that sense of returning back into the earth. And so there's a lot of metaphor associated with, you know, the architecture and the types of materials that are, you know, used to build these structures. And it's a, it's a living connection, I guess, for us to be able to be inside the structure and feel like we're connected to the organicness of the earth. You know, we, we feel like uh, in Hopi cultural traditions, they talk about us coming from previous worlds. And so, this will give you that sense of what it's like, you know, to be inside a structure like this. So if you're ever in the area of Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, go check this out. I know they're having limited um, visit, visitation right now like everybody else, but uh, it's, it's a good institution to go check out. Next slide, please. So here's the interior of a prehistoric Kiva. This is perfect Kiva in Slickhorn Canyon. 
Uh, there's two perfect kivas by name, uh, one in Grand Gulch and this one here in Slickhorn. Uh, this one I feel is more representative of the name perfect kiva. Um, everything but the ladder is still intact. And the ladder, you can go to Edge of the Cedars Museum in Blanding, Utah, and see the original ladder there. The dates, the dendrochronological dates of this structure uh, of the ladder are in the early 1240s, 1241, 42, somewhere in there. And then the roof beams have been dated to about 1220. So that gives you some sense, you know, of how these structures, you know, were built. They were still being incorporated into the architecture at that time. And again, you know, this is a really good representation of returning back into the earth, that metaphor that Hopi people and other Pueblo, you know, attribute to how this transports us, I guess, back in time uh, for us to, you know, feel like we are still connected to our ancestors. And, um, you know, I included this just because it has a really good feel to it in terms of that, that metaphorical feeling of, of actually going back into the earth and having that connection with, you know, you know, not only our ancestors, but where we come from. Next slide, please. So, you know, we've talked a little bit, Steve and, and Susan have uh, talked, you know, about why are they called kivas and what is their intention? Um, I'm not going to go into, you know, a lot of the religious and or ceremonial aspects of it. That's really only for the Kiva members to know those of us that participate in that, um, you know, and I don't want to intrude upon any of the other uh, Kiva societies or their knowledge. But, you know, in part, I think Steve mentioned that, you know, some of these structures were communal use, meaning that they had multiple meanings, you know, or multiple uses. I think in, in today's kind of perspective, when we hear the term kiva, we may strictly associate it, you know, with only ceremonial or religious use. Um, but they did and they still do have multiple uses. Um, things like weaving, you know, still take place in some of those structures. And for a lot of us, you know, what, what that quote up there mentions is really, you know, how I relate to these structures in terms of what I've been taught. And so it provides that kind of, um, special space for us to really be able to communicate who we are as Hopi people, you know, and where did we come from? What are we doing now and where are we headed into the future? So there's a lot of teaching uh, that goes on in these structures. Maybe some of that is not so much nowadays. Again, you know, it's going to vary uh, from Kiva society to Kiva society. And so it just really depends on how uh, the membership comes together and really, you know, interacts with one another. But we still have these spaces available to us. Uh, some of my uncles would tell me, you know, talking gentlemen that are probably in their 70s and 80s now, that when they reached a certain age, probably around puberty, um, their mothers didn't want them around anymore. And so they would send them to the Kiva to kind of hang out. And, you know, they would be taught uh, different instructions or just some place to get them out of the way, maybe, you know, to keep them out of trouble. But um, so these types of things still happen uh, for us at Hopi. You know, we maintain who we are as people. And so this, this structure provides kind of a safe haven for us to be able to share all of the different histories, uh, what we're allowed to know, you know. So there is some stratification of knowledge here at Hopi. And it just varies from Kiva to Kiva. Um, everybody has their own methods of passing on knowledge, you know, and so how we do it in the Kiva that I attend may be different from somebody else, you know, right next door. But the point is, is that they're still available for that kind of teaching society, you know, teaching of knowledge back and forth. Uh, I think I saw a question, are all Kiva societies male? Yes and no. There are female societies that do uh, utilize Kiva structures here at Hopi. We'll get to that again later. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So, you know, one of the questions that I'm often asked, you know, when I'm out uh, on tours or doing other kind of field work, you know, people ask us, how are we as modern day Hopi people related? 
to these people from the past? What are the lines of evidence that we can use that shows that, you know, that validates what we as Hopi people and other Pueblo folks know? You know, our oral traditions speak a lot about how we come from these ancient people that we have traveled, you know, great distances through our migrations across the Southwest uh, and even points further south, north, east, and west. And so, uh, like Susan was talking about, one of the things that we use as that line of evidence is architecture. The, the top picture is an excavated kiva at Awatovi, and the bottom picture is uh, a kiva structure uh, from the Davis, I think it's Davis Ranch, which is way down south um, around Benson area, southern Arizona, in the San Pedro Valley. And so, from the Hopi perspective, we know that our ancestors migrated across this great distance of, you know, throughout the Southwest. And what are the things that we left behind that shows that we as Hopi people are connected to, you know, these distant people? And architecture is one line of evidence that we use. Uh, the kiva on the bottom is really unique in the sense that it represents an aspect of what archaeologists call the Salado culture. And there's a really great um, history behind how people from the Kayenta area, northern, northeastern Arizona, in some ancestral time, migrated south. They, they started making their way back down south and were able to trace their movements through various material culture. Some of it is ceramics, uh, but one of the other aspects that we use is architecture. And so we can see how they uh, moved down south and eventually reached this southern Arizona Southern Puebloan influence uh, start to kind of take hold in, in the Southern Arizona, New Mexico area. And so we can see uh, in one sense how that validates Hopi oral tradition about our migrations, uh, moving across the landscape, you know, and then returning back to Hopi coming together. Uh, the map on the right there is really kind of just a, a schematic. It's not intended to really show direct lines of movement. General routes, you know, I think uh, through a lot of the research that Hopi has done, we've been able to fine tune some of those movements and migration trails. But that's really just to kind of show you some of the movements that people had, you know, as ancestral people uh, moving around the landscape and how we as Hopis can point to, you know, specific lines of evidence that say, or that validate, you know, what our oral traditions have said about our movements where we come from, you know, and then we can package that all up in a nice report, you know, and, and share it with other people. But um, really, it's just a unique way to show that Hopi ancestors were in a lot of different places. And when we say that we come from those people, uh, we have, you know, direct evidence that we can utilize to, to help prove, you know, those points. And um, it, it helps in our self-identity in terms of where we come from. And it's something to hang our hat on in a way that, uh, we're still doing these types of, you know, ceremonies. We're still producing that type of architecture um, that they're not just, you know, rooted in the prehistoric, but they're really, you know, mo rooted here in the modern day as well. You can go to the next slide, please. So I, I kind of wanted to end with a little bit of a longer history here. Um, a lot of times you might hear in archaeology that nothing stays the same, right? That uh, how can we as Hopi people say that we're related to those early people? And what are the, the attributes that have stayed the same? As Hopi people, we, we do acknowledge that our culture has changed. Uh, we have our own cultural designations for those very early people labeled as basket maker. And we've been able to change and designate our cultural progress as we've moved, you know, forward in time. And there are certain things I think that only some of us probably really would say that don't change. You know, there are certain aspects of culture that, that do remain uh, rooted in foundation, rooted in tradition. And those are not easily quantifiable by archaeology. You know, I can't produce uh, a plan view map of cultural tradition. Sometimes I can't you know, quantify it on a, a data sheet, so to speak. And and the, the example I wanted to use is this. So, and this photo is from 1954. The Kiva right in the middle is the one that I go to. And it was the first Kiva built here in Bacalbi when, when the village was established. 
I'm going to have to gloss over a, kind of a lot of history here, but Baklavi was founded um, after the split of Oribe in 1906. Um, the split of Oribe happened then. Uh, the first group left and went to form the village of Hotvela. Later on, uh, a group decided to return back to Oribe and try to reoccupy their homes. They were kicked out again, and those were my people, right? So we got kicked out twice. But part of the deal was that uh, when they relocated to this new location, um, there was supposed to be kind of a fissioning of the ceremonial structure that a lot of the early uh, folks believe that the, the, the use of the culture and religion had become corrupted and people were misusing it against what it was originally intended for. And so to do away with that abuse, it was kind of agreed that they would do away with certain aspects of traditional culture. And so when my founders moved to Bakovi village, they resisted, you know, getting back into the, the traditions of Hopi. But uh, through oral history research that, that the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office has done, you know, they've been, they were able to interview in the early 1980s uh, many of those surviving or grant or children of those early founding folks. And one of the questions that came up was, how did we start to build our kivas again? And so this is the part where, you know, when you really have to think about what is it that, who, who are we as Hopi people? What is it that we have had so ingrained um, within us that we have to continue to carry it on? So. You know, this statement is, I really like that quote. It says, well, we could not stop doing it just like that. You know, they, it was such a part of who they were that they could not forget it. And so they eventually got to building the kivas again. And this one was uh, the first one to be built. My father tells this story that when he was a child, probably right before this photo was taken, he remembers that this kiva had fallen into disuse. The roof was collapsed. Uh, it was being filled with trash. <clears throat> People were no longer util using it as it had originally been intended. And you have to think about what was happening in, in society. You know, during that time, um, there was a lot of oppression of indigenous cultures here. And so, um, you know, it wasn't cool to be native, you know, I guess, so to speak. And so a lot of those traditions, particularly from my grandparents aged and their parents, they had experienced, you know, a lot of that suppression of their own culture, loss of language. And so, you know, they weren't interested in carrying and passing on some of that knowledge. The really cool part about it is that, you know, not soon thereafter, you know, my father put that probably around 1950, 51, maybe that he was a child and remember seeing this Kiva completely in disrepair that somewhere in those you know, years following, the village residents um, had a resurrection. They remembered who they were, and they were able to come together again to once again put the Kiva back together and start to utilize it, you know. So um, some things don't change, I think, within Indigenous culture. And, you know, when I sit down in this structure, uh, that's the thing I really think about is when I look up at the ceiling and I see it fully resurrected, you know, and being utilized by, you know, my fellow members and whoever else, that that's the part of culture, you know, that we've been able to carry on for so many generations since our ancestors. Um, those are the things that we cannot easily forget. And so they're not, they're not, they're hard to let go. It, it, they become so much a part of who we are that we feel that it's, you know, important for us to be able to carry those on, you know, in the present and into the future. So. Um, a lot of times, you know, you'll hear the terms, particularly in reference to places like Chaco or Mesa Verde, you'll hear the terms that it's a ruin or it's abandoned. Uh, we don't necessarily agree with those terms. You know, they, they connotate uh, that there is no life left in those structures. Excuse me. So, you know, remind yourself that even though you may see an empty structure at a national park, Remind yourself that there are still living true descendants out here at Hopi and all the other Pueblos that are still trying to carry on some of these traditions that have been handed down generation after generation. So, uh, you know, I wanted to make that point that, um, you know, we're still 
we're still doing our best to carry on what was handed to us. And yeah, some aspects of our culture have changed, but hopefully what we maintain in these structures as individual Kiva groups, we're able to carry on into the future. Go to the next slide, please. So this is the example, right, of, of what we're trying to carry on here at Hopi. Um, our traditions are not forgotten. You know, we're not the vanished Indian. We're still here able to carry on some aspect of who we are. And it's really important for us, you know, to be able to pass it on to our youth and our younger generations. I think in this day and age, you know, 2020 has really opened a lot of folks' eyes about how important it is to maintain your self-identity, to maintain our cultural uh, well-being. You know, what is it that's going to help sustain us in this hard time? You know, everybody is facing difficult times right now. And it has been hard, I think, for many of us here at Hopi, at least here in my village. Uh, we were able to conduct our spring ceremonies and then everything kind of stopped, you know. And so it's been a little bit, been really difficult for us to have to stay away and not, you know, conduct the ceremonies that we've been doing year after year. And, um, but it really gives us something to reflect on in terms of who we are where we're at in 2020 and what we have to look forward to as indigenous people that there still is going to be a point where we can come together again and continue on, you know, these long traditions that uh, have been carried on, you know, since, uh, well, since the very beginning. And so, um, Seems like we might have, while well, you're sort of frozen up. All right, it seems like we might have lost Lyle, uh, unless someone else is seeing something different than I am. Okay, hopefully, hopefully he'll be able to get back on, but why don't we, um, in the meantime, go ahead and, and address some of the questions. We've got lots of questions and folks, if you have more questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box down at the bottom uh, right. It's on the right on my screen, hopefully it is on yours too. Um, so here's a couple simple questions to start us off. Um, one of our viewers noticed the large rectangular floor features in, in some of the pictures that Susan showed in particular and was wondering if you could explain what those are what we think they are. Uh, I'm guessing that you're referring to what we call floor vaults. And the floor vaults in, in the literature were typically called um, foot drums by archeologists. But interestingly enough, there's a lot of uh, floor vaults still being used in modern day Pueblo society. Um, the reason they were called foot drums is because some archeological examples actually had wooden planks still above the actual floor vault. Um, and today uh, they're still used and we, we think that they're used, well, and I don't know, maybe I should ask Lyle if I'm allowed to share that information. Um, but let's just say that they're used in ceremonies today and that they're not in every household. They're in specialized structures uh, that have to do with the ceremonial calendar. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay, and Lyle is back, welcome back. <laughs> we lost you for a minute there. Um, the question was about, about the rectangular features that we were seeing in, in some of the pictures. I was wondering if you have anything to add to that. Or uh, I think you're referring to like uh, the great Kiva at Aztec and uh, yeah. well, pretty much all the great Kivas, you know, that were shown. Um, some, some of the uh, elders think that, you know, those may have been, uh, we still do what we call or what has been labeled the, the bean ceremony, right? So uh, during the winter months, early in the spring, uh, January, February, um, we go down there and we plant um, beans and they sprout, you know, in that warm environment. Some of the elders think that those might have been utilized for that uh, purpose. Um, they may have had other purposes as well. Um, I think they were definitely uh, multi-use. So it's hard to say, yeah, if, if some of the archaeological evidence 
points to those as being foot drums with the wood plank still on top. I, I don't uh, dispute that. I just think that, uh, yeah, there's probably more than one use that they had, you know, throughout their annual cycle. Okay. We have a bunch of questions about uh, circular kivas versus rectangular kivas. Um, I was wondering if any of you have any comments about the difference, what, what the meaning. <clears throat> I, as far I can... As for, oh. Go ahead, go ahead Steve. No, go ahead, Lon. Uh, I, I can lend a little bit of um, uh, some insight into that. And, and you have to understand um, some aspects of, of what we're taught, you know, are not really uh, allowable to be disseminated to a wide, you know, group such as this. Uh, we definitely, from a Hopi perspective, have our understanding of why circular kivas versus rectangular four-sided kivas. Uh, part of that relates to our migration history. Um, the four-sided kiva may represent those clans that have completed their migrations and have come together. And so therefore, you know, you think of the analogy of the spiral that we see in, in rock art and other, you know, symbology out there. Um, so that circular imagery relates to that movement of people across the landscape. A four-sided kiva has the metaphor of, of the four directions, uh, also different groups of people coming together that have completed those migrations. And I think that that is a uniquely Hopi perspective on that. I've only heard that uh, spoken of, you know, from, from this side. Uh, I don't know, again, what the other Pueblos may have. As far as I know, there are no rectangular kivas other than maybe Zuni and Akuma and Laguna. Um, the Rio Grande Pueblos, I think, still all utilize circular kivas. But, um, Again, you know, there's multiple Kiva groups out there, and we all have our own perspectives on some of this history. And so um, that's one perspective on, on why circular versus, you know, the, the four-sided Kiva structure. Okay. Um, and Lyle, I, I do want to apologize. We kind of lost you there for a minute. Did you want to sort of wrap up your talk or are you, do you want to just continue? Uh, I don't, I don't know where I got cut off. I think um, I was kind of done, you know? Okay. So that's sort of how it felt to me. I, I think, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I finished. Okay. So we have some questions. Um, let's see. So somebody asked about artifacts. Is there a, a pattern to the kinds of artifacts we find archaeologically in kivas or in or around kivas and and does that tell us anything about how they were used yeah i, I can take that one um traditionally when we are looking at kiva floors and the artifact assemblage that's left behind there's a really interesting mix of household activities that are taking place so we can see anything from stone tool scatters to whole vessels to manos and matates. So the signature that we see archeologically is incredibly domestic and all the different activity spaces within the structure that were taking place. That being said, there's also examples where people intentionally placed objects on the Kiva floor prior to depopulating the structure. And that gives us a really cool insight into the preparation that's involved before that um, structure is no longer being used that way. And so that lends insights into how people prepare things as well, not just all the activities that took place in the structure for the decades and sometimes centuries leading up to the depopulation of it. Steve, do you want to add anything or Lyle? Uh I think we might have lost Lyle again, unfortunately. I'm afraid so. No, I'm here. Oh, okay. good, good. Okay. I'm here. Yeah, the pattern Susan's talking about that, you know, you get a lot of domestic material in, in these small pre-1300. That's what I've been talking about. Round rooms and little square rooms before 1300. After that, I think it gets a little more interesting. Okay, well, we've had a couple, for a while specifically, we've had a couple of questions about 
whether Kiva societies are sort of equal and equivalent to a clan or a family or whether there's cross-cutting. Uh, in general, Kivas uh, are cross-cutting, you know, all of the community. And, and Steve made the, the, the suggestion or he stated something about does every family have a Kiva? And, you know, his reference was about every uh, family unit structure having a specific Kiva associated with it. I would say that in today's modern society, that still holds true in the sense that every family has a Kiva that they're associated with. It may not be, I mean, because we're so aggregated now in our village communities, so many different people coming together, but uh, every family has maybe one or two or maybe even more Kivas that they're associated with. But at least in, in my own personal experience, um, my Kiva group is associated with many different clan members, uh, some village members coming from other villages. Um, so it can definitely cross cut, you know, all different levels of, of the community organization. Um, it may differ in some of the other, other Kiva groups, you know, uh, here at Hopi. Um, but yeah, just in general, it's kind of, um, incorporating all different aspects of, of the social group there. Yeah, and sort of a related question for Susan and Steve. Um, when you talked about kivas, you talked about architecture. Um, can archaeologists talk about the society, the social role of kivas um, in the same way that, that Lyle talks about a kiva society? Sure. Um, you know, early on, you know, from basket maker through Pueblo Three, there's one of these things for every family for each five rooms. After 1300, you get one. You get something that's probably more, much more like the kinds of kivas that Lyle's talking about for 300 people. So you're going from like you know 10 people per whatever these things are earlier to um, again cross cutting groups of, of people in a village or in a, in a, a plaza area. Where <clears throat> I was just doing the math on um, Lyle said there was a couple dozen kivas out at Hopi. And I don't know, is it eight or nine thousand people live at Hopi at this point? I mean, you know, it's several hundred people per each one of those kivas. Not that each kiva has that X number of, of folks. It's just that they're servicing much, much. Servicing is the wrong term, but there's they're filling a function for a much larger groups of people than those five rooms in a kiva things we're doing. Those are for a family, I'm pretty sure. Um, but the, the the modern kivas, and and they, and they're not saying this is only modern times, but after 1300 at least, those, those numbers change dramatically where you get one of those things for like 300 people or one of those things for 400 people. So that's architecture, it's, con it's a context, an architectural context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to tee off of that, Steve mentioned an important point, which is the plaza takes over one of the functions of the Great Kivas. And so after 1300 AD, there's very few Great Kivas constructed in these villages where there's a reduced number of structures. So when everybody stops having an individual private Kiva as part of the household and people start to use, I would call it um, almost an appropriated Kiva by the whole community, you no longer see Great Kivas because the plaza is the place where that social integration is taking place at a much larger scale than just the Kiva that your family or you yourself may be initiated into. Okay, so we've had some questions about the orientations of Kiva, um, of Kivas in different places in different times. Um, so one question, how do we understand the macro regional differences in Kiva orientation between East oriented in the Rio Grande region and South oriented in the San Juan region? But maybe more generally, um, thoughts about Kiva orientations. House form and culture. Amos Rappaport had it back in the 60s that you, you build a house that looks like what your grandparents grew up in, your great grandparents. That, that, that kind of stuff, the, the form of, of a domestic architecture really lasts for a long time. It, it is cross culturally. I'm not just talking about, you know, just in, in the Southwest, but cross culturally, uh, when people are building their own houses, they build them like the one that grandpa had. And so, yeah, you know, in the Rio Grande, they, 
I, I'm sure there is a, a, a very important ideological component to facing East. I don't know what that is. I'm, you know, I'm not a Rio Grande Pueblo person, but you know, I think the reason they're doing it when they're when their houses at least is because that's what it's supposed to look like. We had a really interesting question that I hadn't thought about that much. Um, has there been any testing, any research about the acoustics of the of a round shape as opposed to a square shape? Whether that's I, I saw that. I, I had an <clears throat> honor student who did an acoustical <laughs> study of the reconstructed kivas at the uh, Spruce Street House, I think, mm -hmm. at Mesa Verde. And no, she just looked at the round one. And you know, play games, moving the microphone around, and she had you know all kinds of gadgets, and gizmos, and stuff. And uh, there wasn't anything uh, that jumped right out at her. I mean, she wasn't an acoustician. I mean, you know, she she's just making this up as a senior or junior, or senior, something like that. But she said that it it uh, um, what's we sort of amplified lower tones. That you know that lower lower tones, not not higher pitch tones, but lower tones were amplified by that round uh, shape. So interesting. Okay. So just to build on that a little bit too, one of the unique features about Casa Rinconada is this underground ramp where people could have entered unseen by all the participants inside of the Great Kiva entered up that ramp and then magically appeared on the floor of the structure. And you can almost imagine the performative aspect of architecture. The acoustics are part of that, but so are the light inside of the structure, the, the way that costumes may look in the firelight. There's, there's lots of qualities about these structures that are imbued with those things that we can't see archeologically, but they're fun to test through experimental archeology. span Yeah, so sorry, I, I, I've, got, I've got a couple of questions on folks um, asking about the doors. Were Kiva's always accessed from the roof? Um, or are there other doors? You mentioned that ramp at Rinconada. Yeah, so I guess it depends what time period we're talking about. There are some early structures that are considered pit houses that do have ramp entryways. Uh, but for the most part, in the Pueblo 2 and Pueblo 3, we're seeing entryways coming down off of the roof. You go in through the ladder, which goes back to that reference that Lyle made about how do we think about these as cosmological representations. If you're going up and down a ladder, that represents an emergence, basically, as you come back out of the structure. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's if you guys want to chime in, go ahead. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought, so go ahead. Anybody else can go ahead. <laughs> I would say that, uh, like in the photo I showed of, of the Kiva from 1954, you see a door there. Um, but from what I understand is that um, prior to kind of European influence, uh, side entryways like that were not really common, that most Kivas were only entered in through the hatchway. Uh, with one, you know, access point in and out. And then later on, um, things like modern doors, you know, started to become incorporated into those things. Um, but, you know, again, uh, it could, it, I think it varies from village to village and how those structures are, are first built and then later modified. So I, I think from, from my perspective, a side entry doorway uh, is kind of a, a new uh, influence. Okay, well, we have a ton of questions, but um, it's going on 515, so I think we need to wrap it up. I do want to let participants know that we're going to share these questions with the, with the panelists. Um, thank you all so much for sharing your knowledge and your thoughts, and um, all, to all the participants, thank you for joining us, and hope you can join us for next week's uh, talk on climate, and uh, thank you all. Well, thank you. Right. Everybody stay safe. And healthy. Okay. Thanks for spending Thank time you. with us, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Hello. See you, Steve.